Good morning, everyone. Hopefully everyone's had a wonderful weekend. Uh, so for anyone who's just joining in, uh, hey, my name is Ben Rojan, aka The CL Data Guy. Um, if you're curious about my background, um, before I guess doing just consulting full time, I worked at Facebook as a data engineer. Um, prior to that, at several startups and hospitals. So I've been doing data engineering um, for the last uh, almost 10 years at this point. Uh, basically the whole time almost as I was doing uh, like working full time, I kind of started to pick up consulting. So that's why eventually uh, in 2021, I was actually able to quit working full time at Facebook and, and do this. Um, so today we're going to kind of talk about, you know, uh, consulting. And, and I think the big question I get a lot from a lot of people is, you know, do, do I know I'm ready? Like, how, how do I know that I'm, I'm ready to uh, consult? Um, and f from my perspective, you know, I didn't like jump into consulting all at once. Um, I, I wasn't like suddenly, you know, quitting my job and being like, all right, you know, let's, let's try this consulting thing. Like I said before, I, I started consulting, honestly, almost a year into working full time. S someone had asked me, they were like, Hey, I'm, I need some help working on a project. And so, you know, they're like, do you, do you want to, you know, do this on the side and I was like yeah sure like let's set up an LLC and, and let's kind of go at this so that was kind of how I was introduced to consulting and then I just started basically finding projects here and there um, so I kind of view it as the there are kind of levels as you, you do consulting so you can totally just maybe on the side often you know take one-off project here a one-off project there and just see if you even like um, to consult because it is a little bit different um, than working full-time you do have to be a little more um, on top of whatever is going on. Um, you, you can't just like dive into, uh, you know, uh, you can't just like start uh, like a normal company where you've got like a month or two to onboard and you kind of have to start working and immediately drive value. And so it's a little bit of a different mentality in terms of how you approach your, your work. Um, so once you've kind of done some side hustling, I think then you can start looking at you know, do I like consulting and kind of what's next for you? Um, there's, there's a few questions coming in. Can I get a chance to work with your company? Oh, I, I no, I don't have any current internships. So someone was asking if they have any internships. I don't currently. Um, there are some questions here, so I actually might just jump in on some of these. Here, here's kind of one that I, I think is um, always interesting just because, you know, I think building a brand is something I did um, well, not like fully on purpose, but I think it's it's good to have a brand as a consultant because there are so many so many other people you're competing with, one, but also it, it's just a great way to stand out. And in today's world where there's like a million ways you can build a brand, you know, there, there's plenty of opportunity. Uh, I, I think one of the things I was concerned about when I was like trying to build my brand, you know, I started doing the, the cliche thing, which is like starting to write a blog. Um, was, you know, there's already a million blogs out there. Like, why would anyone read my blog? Um, so, so finding like a voice and, and trying to be interesting in, the, in that regard, I think was really important. Uh, I, I think the other thing is you don't have to pick every uh, medium to, to build your brand as a consultant, right? Like sometimes you'll see people like across 10 different mediums, right? They've got their LinkedIn, they're posting all the time, they're uh, they have a YouTube, they've got a, a newsletter, they've got a blog, they've got everything. When I look at like how I've kind of built my like marketing approach uh, and brand over time, I really would spend a lot of time on one area before moving to the next. So I wrote a blog, um, both on Medium and on my own um, personal blog, probably for a few years um, before even looking at things like YouTube. Uh, I, and I've seen this uh, also with other people who've been kind of building their brand. Uh, I think Chad Sanderson is another good example of that, where he built a really solid, I want to say it was LinkedIn first and then Substack. Um, and it, I don't know if anyone knows who Chad is, but if you've seen Chad on LinkedIn, that's kind of the, the approach that I believe he's taken. Um, so I, I think it's great to like focus on one medium that you want to do really well at, figure out what it means to do well in that medium. Um, and then you build up kind of a backlog of content that you can then share around on your your next few uh, mediums. Um, so yeah, I think building a brand is great. It, it creates kind of this connection with, with whoever, uh, your customers are and clients are that can then easily be transferred into, you know, 
clients um, acquisition. So I think building a brand is a great way to kind of almost, I don't want to say cheap, but like, it, it's just an easier way to get noticed nowadays. In, in the in the past, in order to like, get like become a consultant, if you really want to get into it, you probably have to work, you know, 10, 20 years in the industry, not so much just for the experience, but also just to have enough of a network that you could then, you know, go and consult, right? Like you've got enough people that you could go reach out to and build, you know, relationships and things of that nature. But these days, right, like, you know, with a few, you know, maybe five, 10 years of experience, you you can already have built a decent brand that people are going to likely reach out to you anyways, um, if you if you're sharing enough information. Um, so I think that's always great. Let me see, build your brand and what tips do you have? So yeah, so I, that, that's kind of my tips there, you know, pick a medium, figure out kind of what you want to write about, figure out what your your value proposition and what pain points you want to solve. Um, figure out what those things are and then kind of just target those. Like don't try to do everything, right? Like don't try to write um, all of the content. Um, even like with me, like writing so much intro stuff isn't always the best. Like it gets a ton of eyeballs when you write intro content. But, you know, if your goal is to um, hit, you know, decision makers uh, in, in companies, they're not necessarily looking up, you know, how to become a data engineer. I think it's good at some level because it gets you some uh, initial traction, but eventually you want to occasionally start branching out from that and write, you know, higher level content. Let's see. Well, I don't know if I can answer this one just yet, but um, what are your thoughts about cold calling and emailing? So I, I'm an okay um, cold emailer. What What's nice. I've, I've kind of gone the let's build a brand and then let's go from there approach. Um, it, there are people who are great salespeople who with no, with no warm intro can probably sell, right? Like they're, they're really good at it. I've seen people do it. Um, I've, I've naturally, like my strategy has been like, I want people to know what my face looks like. I want people to know who I am. So that way, if I ever do write a cold email, they already kind of have a perception of me. Um, that's one reason, again, I, I do like having a brand. I do like having so much content out there. And then I can always like point people to it. It's like, oh, you had this question. I already answered it here in this video. Um, it, it, it does work. If you're, if you're very clear on it, if you're very good at it, it, it can work. You just have to be very targeted. Um, I've seen people, what they've, that there's a few people that I've seen do this really well, well, where they're very aware of what the client's problems are before even sending an email. So it, overall, it's not always super effective unless you know exactly who you're targeting. But if you have a very targeted email um, towards a person, it can be super effective. Let's see. Just curious, what are the questions? No, not, I'm going to have to skip anything. It's like how you get started in the data field. Um, this one. So I, I was actually looking thinking about freelancing for a while, still looking for my first role. Is it possible without any data experience? I mean, I, I'd be curious what you mean without any data experience, right? Like if you're, if you're going into um, a data consulting um, project and you have no experience, it's going to be hard. Um, but if, if, if you already have, like if you've got at least like the background, like you, you know how to code, maybe you haven't done it in like a job setting, but you've done everything else, right? Like you, you've learned about data warehousing, you've learned about SQL, you've learned about Python, whatever you're trying to consult in. Um, there's definitely opportunities that you can consult in. They're not going to be giant projects, right? They're going to likely be um, small, medium business type companies, SMBs, that maybe need a $1,000 or $2,000 project um, in terms of help. That, that This is probably a great place for someone who like maybe wants to do Upwork as their method of like client acquisition, right? Because you can kind of talk a little bit about what you've got. Uh, maybe you can give a really good rate that people will probably say yes to, even if you don't have a great rating. Um, and then eventually you get a good rating because um, you do such a good job and then kind of transfer from there. Uh, but it, it it's going to depend on what you mean by no experience. Like you, you should have some experience coming into obviously consulting. Um, but most likely what you're going to be doing is not pure consulting. It's what it's more contracting. Um, there's a slight difference in the, like technically with consulting and contracting. Um, so contracting and, and since we do technical work, a lot of our stuff tends to be that contracting tends to be like staff augmentation. Like maybe this company has the, the expertise to do the work. They just need someone to come in 
and like do this work because they don't have enough staff, right? Like they don't want to hire a full-time person. So they're going to hire you to just finish up some work or, or finish a project or start a project that they just don't have time to start. Um, it's better for them versus hiring an employee because, you know, they don't have to pay all the benefits and guarantee a salary for, you know, until that person quits. So that, that's usually the type of work you'll get. Contracting tends to be more hands-on, tends to be work that they, they've already defined for you. Like they already know what they, they want you to do. They don't really want your opinion. They just kind of want you to do it. Um, whereas consulting tends to be usually a combination of both. Uh, you can do pure consulting where it's like, I, I've done the, these projects where I just give an opinion. Uh, you know, I'll spend like two months looking at something and then write up a 30 page report and be like, here's my opinion. Here's what I think you should do. Um, but there's also, you know, projects where it's like, here's my opinion. Here's what I think you should do. Now I'm going to do it for you. So um, it, that's kind of a slight difference. One is you generally give more of an opinion um, that hopefully drives value and you're generally higher up on the decision chain. Whereas contracting, you know, you might even just be working under a manager uh, who's already made all the decisions for you. This is always an interesting, interesting question. What's the importance of partnering with a sales specialist versus going solo as a data analytics professional? So I, I still occasionally have people who, who you know, their special, special speciality um, is selling, right? Uh, that's not my biggest strength. I'm great at marketing, great at branding, okay at selling. And so sometimes, yeah, like if I have a friend who's like really good at selling and they've got a project that they've already sold and done the hard work for, yeah, I'd be like, yeah, I'm happy to kind of do some work for you, um, depending on the pay. Uh, but it's kind of nice to have multiple streams that possible clients could be coming from. Because whatever the reason is, right, like it, there's just this ebb and flow of clients from each um, possible um, basically stream, right? Like sometimes marketing is working great. I get so many clients from it that, you know, I, I can't even handle, you know, taking uh, the occasional side project from a, from a friend who's doing more of the sales route. But sometimes marketing kind of just takes a lull for a month or two. And if if, if one of the, the avenues that I use uh, from a selling partner happens to bring me some work, it's great. You 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 do tend to, to lose, obviously, a little value because obviously this person has done something for you, right? It's it's kind of a nice that they've sold this or, or yeah sold your skills for you. So you kind of have to know that they're going to take a little bit off the top um, when, when you do that. Um, I... It is nice, to, I think, to have a person who does selling really well. It, it just lets you focus on the technical side a little more and less on the, the trying to um, <clears throat> find clients. The flip side is you always need that person, right? If you don't build up some route that clients come to you from and you're just stuck doing it, or sorry, you, you have someone else doing it for you, you never have the ability to leave that situation. Um, so that, that's kind of the risk there. So I would at least have another avenue you eventually build up that you are good at, whether that's marketing, whether that's networking. Um, you just need to figure out another way that you're good at getting clients. Oh, there's a lot of questions. Oh, this is always, this is interesting. So how do you productize your service as a consultant? Uh, to some degree, right, like <laughs> consultants, don't necessarily have like a product they can sell, uh, which is, you know, good and bad. It means you can kind of fit any problem, but bad because if you want to like make things repeatable, it becomes hard. Um, the, there is the kind of work that's like very standardized. So like Greenfield projects to me are very, very standardized. It, it's very kind of clear on how I approach it. Um, and I, I don't necessarily have it as a product, but I kind of sell it as a product where I have a price tag, um, for it regardless uh, of who I'm doing the work for. So productize is, is interesting. In theory, you should see a lot of the same problems over and over again, which then should lead you to, you know, some sort of product idea. Um, and there, there are companies that have done that where they've like been a consulting company and they've just seen the problem over and over and over again. And then they've kind of packaged it and almost build like a SaaS product off of it. So that's totally an option for, for what you can build. The other thing is you can what I often view things more as like package things. So it's like, oh, okay, I always get like whatever greenfield projects. How could I like make it so that when I set up a fresh new data stack, that it's just like one click of a button, you know, that that would be uh, a product around setting up your data stack, right? Um, and in fact, at this point, I've seen products like that. So I, I'm not building it because I've seen at least three or four like that where I'm trying to partner with those products. But yeah, I think it's like when you see like repeatable things that you keep doing, 
And if you think you can automate it some way or build an, an easy way um, to do that, that's generally a product you can build uh, around the service. It's there, But there are just so many other things that are not really easy to build a product around. Like in audit, there's not a lot to build around there. It's kind of just an audit. You kind of have to do it. Um, everyone's a little custom. Everyone's a little different. You're giving an opinion. Uh, yes, you have your templates, but there's no real product there. <laughs> What's this? Does your client require coding screening to give you work? Um, what is the most difficult thing you find out when you nail the contract? How do you decide? Okay, there's a lot of questions. I'm going to answer one of these. Um, does your client require coding screening? I've I've had a few that wanted to do coding screening. I've I've pretty much always pushed that. Down. Like I'm. I, I don't have time to like stop and do a coding screening every time. I, I totally respect what they're trying to do. I get that they want to like feel like they can, um, you know, feel like they can actually feel like something is safe. Like they want to make sure they're hiring you uh, to do some work. Sorry, my, uh, what's My, my cat's having zoomies. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I, usually when, um, if, if a cat or if a cl cat, sorry, now I'm thinking about the cat because she's going crazy over here. Um, usually if my my client asks for a coding screening, I kind of just pass because I, I just have other things to do, like get more clients, get, you know, things of that nature. Now, if you have no clients and, you know, you need to do a coding screening, I, I do it. But when I have so much other work, I'm, I'm generally going to just pass on it. It's like I, I don't need that project. I have plenty of others. So, for which target group should you write a blog if you want to consult executives or experienced engineers? So this is always interesting. Um, I, I I always wanted to write for more experienced engineers, but it, it's kind of like when you go to conferences where it's just around the topic that you're trying to consult on. Everyone has the skill set that you're working for or is trying to get it. So it's not always the most opportune place uh, to work as a consultant um, or to try to get more clients as a consultant. But um, what I've noticed, for example, in the data world is places that I get a lot of consulting like requests from are often sales teams, are often marketing teams, um, teams that have one budget. Fun fact, data teams don't have as much budget, budget often as marketing teams or sales teams. So they have budget to do work. And they want to get access to data. And either one, they don't have data teams or data teams aren't moving fast enough. There, there's some sort of gap here. So generally, if you write for those executives with clear solutions, that that will be um, an easier sell. Um, sometimes, obviously, I get data team requests. I, I've had plenty of those as well. But I, I would say that it's usually at the executive level, right? Like, And I do mix it up because at the same time, um, very few people look at like the high level articles or are Googling those high level articles. Um, like what metrics should we be using for, you know, a marketing team or something. But a lot of people will look at like, what is Airbyte? What is Airflow? Um, so that's generally like top of funnel for, in my view, it's like, okay, I've got these, these articles that are top of funnel that I'd like to bring people down eventually into articles that are a little more specific. Um, so you, you, you'll start, I think writing broad, but you'll start eventually writing more and more niche as you go down. Uh, speaking of Upwork, have you done that before? Do you like going that route? I have not gone down the Upwork route. Uh, Shashank, who was on the last live, actually did do that. Uh, I want him to make a video for the course that I'm, I'm putting together for that reason. What, what I will say about Upwork, it's obviously it's like, it's a great way to get into um, like contracting and freelancing fast, right? It's a marketplace. You put yourself out there, right? You say your skills. You kind of have to, I imagine, always, unless you have a good brand starting, you have to be cheap to begin. Um, like as someone who's used Upwork, my personal choice is often like, oh, okay, who's got good ratings? Okay, based off who has good ratings, you know, what's a good price? And so that's kind of generally my um, process. So you kind of have to give a good price just to stand out. Um, and then eventually, once you have good ratings, then people at least then I care a little bit less about price as long as whoever I'm working with has good ratings. Because for me, my goal when I go to Upwork is I want to solve a problem. And as long as I find someone that solves that problem well, I care a little less about price. Um, I'm not completely price adverse. Obviously, I'm not going to go with the most expensive if, if there's a $45 hour 
$45 an hour option and a hundred dollar an hour option. I'm going to pick the 45 if they've got the same rating, but you know, overall um, it's a great way to get clients quickly. Again, kind of similar to having like a friend that's a sales specialist. You, you then don't have any, have, you've never worked on that muscle to get clients. And so then you won't necessarily get clients in the future. And so that, that's the one risk is you need to make sure if you do that, you start getting referrals, you start getting like ways that you can get future clients from, from the clients you get from Upwork. So that, that's something I think that's important. Mm, this is, this is hard. How do you move from freelancing into expanding um, the team and hiring? Do you focus on one aspect, visualization, or try to cover full data value chain? So the, the way I've seen companies time and time again go from purely um, like a one-person team to building like a massive team is generally they have a method to get tons of clients. And generally that method is partnering with a vendor, um, especially a vendor that's like becoming very popular suddenly. Um, I've seen people do this with when Tableau became really big in the early 2000s or like 2010s. I've seen people do that with Snowflake, with GCP, uh, with Looker, DBT, all these things that have come into play. If you become like the expert at that thing that everyone wants to do suddenly, there's just so much work around that space. One, sometimes the vendors will partner with you and just send you work that's, you know, for mid mid-sized companies where you need to have three to five people deploying a project. Uh, and two, like everyone's Googling and looking into this new idea, right? Like right now, I mean, I don't think, this, I don't know how long this is going to last, but I'm sure this is why I've seen like Accenture uh, jumping on the LLM chat GPT train, right? Because everyone's looking into this. They're like, how do we do this? How do we implement this? Um, so that's generally a great time to like figure out, hey, I'm going to become a specialist at this thing. And, you know, we'll kind of ride this wave. And then when the next wave comes, you kind of ride that one and you keep building it. Because what you end up having is this really hard um, problem where, you know, if you get a project that makes, needs three people, okay, you hire those three people. Well, then the next project, you only need one person. So do you fire those other two people? And then you kind of keep going back and forth. And so you, you kind of end up in this weird space where you're constantly having to like find enough people for the work if you're just doing one-off projects. So if you're not connected to like a vendor, it's really hard to scale fast enough um, and, and get work fast enough for the, the people that you have, um, that you have. So um, yeah, that, that, that's the challenge there. I don't think it's so much about what you focus on. It's more about like picking a wave that's ex exploding, you know? So I think it's generally the thing there. Let's see. This is interesting. Do you think uh, IT or data engineering roles, especially management roles are being taken by other countries, essentially, and Americans are struggling to get jobs or clients. No, I, I don't think so. I think there's still plenty of work, um, you know, in America. I get plenty of clients um, uh, in the U.S. And, and even outside the U.S., actually. I've had, I've had plenty of clients outside the U.S. as well um, who reach out to me. So there's always plenty of work, um, you know, if, if you can stand out. There's, there's a lot of reason people hire people. Like I referenced earlier um, on Upwork, I actually, I think, I think I'm paying my editor upwards of almost 25 or $30 an hour and they're not in America and I'm happy to pay that rate. Like I'm happy to pay them a rate that would probably be even arguably decent here. Um, not great, but decent. Um, if they do the job and solve the problem, even if they're spending, honestly, the amount that I'm spending on it, if they were only spending half an hour and, and doing it and charging me an hour, I wouldn't care because to me, it's like the problem is solved. So I, I think there's always like, there's, there's this, whole like, hey, if the problem solved, I don't care. I mean, I've seen people do offshore projects that took two times as long as it should have because of all the communication kind of back and forth. Um, that That's one problem that you run into. It's not, you know, it's not a guaranteed pro like problem, but it, it can run into it. Like you can run into this like weird communication, like lag that really, really eats into your, your project if you don't have a good project manager to manage it. Um, I've seen people manage that whole weird communication uh, disparity, like, you know, that one like one day essentially essentially lost but that can usually eat into your project and then you know drag out something that should take like three months into six nine twelve months so there are pros and cons but i think we're fine now let's see ah ben you mentioned finding a niche to make your voice heard 
maybe don't uh, blog because there are a million blogs. Since you're a small fish, what value do you find in um, attending a big conference? So yeah, I think you're 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 definitely somewhat right, but also I think there are ways you can drive traffic to a blog. So uh, again, I'm going to pick Chad Sanderson again because he's done a great job of using LinkedIn to then take his audience from LinkedIn and convert it um, to his Substack, which is more of a newsletter. But that's really kind of I think a great approach is. You're totally right. Like, why would someone look up your blog when they, there's companies that you're competing with that have SEO specialists, you know, that make it really hard to compete with? Um, but I think there are other methods. Um, if you have a very interesting take or a very different take than everyone else's cliche blog that you can kind of sell. Um, LinkedIn is a great place to kind of build an audience because it just has a really good distribution. Like if I have a, if I have an, um, a post blow up and it's got a link attached to it, you know, I'll see hundreds, if not thousands of views suddenly to an article if it was connected. So that's a great way to kind of push traffic. And when I first started, um, yeah, my blog, no one visited it until I was writing on Medium, which it was similar, um, where it was like it had great distribution. Um, and suddenly people were going to my blog, it was building my SEO. So there are ways you can, I think, still use a blog. Um, in terms of like attending a conference. So this is like, you have to be good at networking for this to make sense. Like you have to kind of one, be good at like meet, like knowing who you want to meet and knowing why you want to meet them and making an effort to like meet those people, have that ask or, or have that whatever value you want to get from that meeting planned ahead of time. I think most people, and I, I, I'm definitely, uh, you know, I've definitely done this. Like you just go and think like things will happen, right? Like you're like, oh, I'll meet people and magic will happen and we'll have clients. Um, if you don't come in with a plan and don't know who you want to meet or in general, you know, what your goal is, you know, even if it's something small, like I'm going to meet 20 people and try to get like five emails or something and have five follow-up conversations, um, a conference isn't useful. So just me, if you go with a plan and, and a goal and then like a clear kind of follow-up set of goals after the conference, I think it's great. Uh, I don't think most people do that. <laughs> Let's see. What is what domains are you finding the most uh, demand in right now? Pipeline development, DB development, ER modeling, dashboard development, AI ML. Um, I'd say for me, it's 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 always been a lot of data engineering generally. So it's like data pipeline development or um, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, data warehouse development, dashboarding, and dashboarding is not necessarily you know uh, data engineering, but that kind of set of processes. When I first started my consulting company, I really, really wanted to do, um, I really wanted to do data science and ML. And it just, I wrote tons of articles on it. I tried to reach out to people on it and it never came, like it just never became a thing. So um, yeah, it, it just never connected. But like data engineering, as soon as I started like shifting, cause that's what I was doing anyways in my day-to-day -day job. As soon as I started writing on that type of content, I mean, I just got more and more work everywhere. Um, hold on one second. Will I... I had a slight size of infection last week, so just some le remnants. Um, yeah, so honestly, I everyone always needs the data engineering and and. and data warehouse side, because in order to often do the whole AI ML, you kind of need to make sure that stuff's set up and no one has that stuff set up. Well, like as much as we think everyone's got, you know, a perfect set of data. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. cats. Um, so as much as you think that like everyone has a perfect data warehouse set up, um, that there's still so much work there. Uh, it's, it's almost never ending because something always changes, right? A data source needs to get migrated. A uh, data pipeline, we're switching from Airflow to Prefect or Mage, or we're, we're, you know, we're going to DBT, we're migrating off DBT. So there's always this endless work that tends to need to be done there. Let's see. Can you build a data consulting company without being huge on social media? Totally. Um, you don't have to be big on social media. In fact, there, I know there's plenty of people who are just really good at like the vendor partnership game. So they're really good at like 
being partners with vendors, driving value to the vendors, and then the vendors sending more clients to them. Um, you can also be really good at networking. And a lot of people who are just like, they've just created networks over time, even over the last three or four years. And that's where they start. They like go back to like their first company and they're like, hey, can I do this work for you again? I'll just consult. And they're like, oh yeah, we need that help. And then we'll kind of build from there. Um, yeah, I, I've done the social media route, but there's there's a ton of, of routes and I'll be covering a lot of this in, in, um, in the course that I've been putting together, but there's a ton of different routes, um, honestly, that you can go. Marketing, branding, that's what I like doing, but you know, you can be good at sales, you can be good at networking. There, there's a ton of other options. <laughs> Have you considered doing paid one-on-one -on -one data career consulting? Because I would like to pay you for a session like this. <laughs> um, so right now I'm, I'm putting together something for consulting around like the data world. So that's something I am doing um, just because I keep getting more and more people asking me about like, oh, like I want to you know, know more about consulting. So that will be a route. Um, but uh, other than that, I'm, I don't generally do too much like just quick one-offs. Um, I'm, I'm basically trying to make it more of a product because otherwise it just ends up being like a one-off here, one-off there. How long does it take you to complete a project on average? Um, generally, I try to do like three month sprint, like not sprints, but like a three month kind of chunk. Um, most of my packages are, are, are kind of envisioned around that where it's like, okay, 30, 60, 90 day plans where I can clearly see what I want to do in that 30, 60, 90 days, you know? Um, so that's generally how long most of my projects take. But if most, like after those projects take those 90 days, probably 70% of them convert into a long-term project. Like even if it's just like, you know, keeping the lights on or maybe uh, some sort of retainer deal. So, you know, even there, I'd, I'd say things kind of continue to, to go forward. Let's see. Let's see. So this is interesting. I have a question regarding positioning. I'm positioning myself as a scholar data engineer. Is it better to niche down further like data engineer for finance or some other industry. No, I don't think you have to, you shouldn't have to niche down too much further because Scala is already a very specific, I feel like data engineering like solution or like tool set, just because, you know, there are people that use Scala for data engineering, but there's not like tons of companies, but it's a very specific use case. So I do think there's, there's value there. Um, I'd almost, I'd, I'd hope you don't feel too limited there. I'd be curious to know like how, how if you're finding business well, I mean, when you find business, I'm sure you can charge them a decent amount because Scala data engineering is arguably a harder problem than normal. Um, so I'm sure it's really good. But I think the flip side is I hope it, it feels like you can find enough work in that space. Um, I know that there are some people uh, in the US or some companies that use it, but I also know a lot of companies just use Python. So I'd be curious in that regard. Let's see. How do you know if you are ready for starting your own uh, data engineering consulting company, skills experience wise? I really don't want to mess up, end up in paying for the loss. Yeah, this is actually interesting, right? Because I, I think I wrote an article about this. I don't know if you guys are signed up for. Like, I think pretty much everyone here is on the newsletter. Um, I talked about like the first time I had a consulting project that was six figures. I was like, oh man, like, like after it was like literally after I signed the contract, I was like, oh, if I mess up, right? Like, there's there's this risk of a lawsuit. Um, cause they were an enterprise organization, right? Like they're a big organization. They have lawyers, um, up until this point, you know, I'd done a lot of SMB, like that no one's going to sue you for like $5,000. I mean, maybe someone's going to, but more than likely not, it's not worth, you're going to pay the lawyer more just to look at the problem. Um, then, then to just maybe ask for the money back or something like that. Um, but yeah, at this point, no one had ever done anything where I was like, Oh, I've done a bad job. So this was the first time I was like, Oh man, like if we mess up, there's a, there's a, possible lawsuit on the other side. So overall, that's that's kind of what I'm like would recommend, right? Like the first few projects I had weren't these like six figure projects. And that's kind of great. Um, it, it's some it's something similar that people have told me about YouTube where it's like, what's great about YouTube is your content, if it's terrible, only a few people see it. So, you know, you don't you don't feel like you've messed up that much. And the same thing here. It's like if you've done a project that's really small, if you mess up, like probably no one's going to sue you. They're, they might make the worst comes to worst. Maybe they'll ask for their money back. Maybe they'll only pay you half of what they told you they're going to pay you. Um, but overall, you know, it, it's not going to be that much of a risk. Um, so, you know, you won't know you're ready. You might as well just try to find the occasional side project here or there. That's maybe, you know, a few grand. 
extra that maybe isn't necessarily worth your time completely, but in the long run, it will be. So, you know, I, I don't feel, I, I wouldn't recommend feeling too scared about it. Um, if you can find a project that's like small, like try taking it on, seeing, see what you can do. Um, and then eventually you'll start finding those bigger projects. And once you've delivered one or two um, smaller projects. <laughs> Let's see. Interesting. What is this? Is it viable to develop a reusable, scalable data architecture and use it to ETL jobs for many clients instead of developing their architecture? I rent mine and generate data from them. I maybe kind of know what you're saying. Like maybe you build like one template data architecture and build off that. I mean, I've seen people do that where they just kind of have something that they plug and play. Um, I don't know if, if you mean like they're going to rent it or you're going to rent it. And I obviously wouldn't mix streams. Like I wouldn't have... Uh, 10 clients on one a one AWS instance, you know, kind of thing. Um, unless you build a product that has like clear security. But if you're doing consulting, right? Like you want to at least make sure that like, if you have a template, that's fine. But make sure that that template is on separate instances. There's, there's a lot of security stuff that you can't just like have people's data shared on the same space. Um, so... Let's see. Data, data, Mirai, Mirai, Mirai. You, you ask a lot of questions. So I'm going to try to see if anyone else has other questions so I don't miss people. <laughs> oh, this is interesting. I want to build a consulting company on data science and data engineering. I want to charge a monthly fee for calls with clients and then offer products for data engineering or data science. What do you think? Um, I mean, I think the, the first part's interesting, right? Like you might be almost, you're charging almost like a subscription. It sounds like, um, just for them to be able to have a certain amount of calls a month. Um, that's, that's an interesting idea. There, are, there are these interesting, like, um, knowledge networks, I guess you'd call them where like they, they email me all the time. They're like, Hey, we have this like client that like wants a call with you for like 45 minutes. Um, we'll pay you like $300 for those, you know, for an hour. Um, just to give them some advice. They only come up like every, maybe once or twice a month. And I'm sure that's probably what they've, they've developed. They've developed these knowledge networks of people that then they, they charge a subscription fee to. Um, and then, you know, they get so many calls a month to ask about certain problems that they have and certain technical issues. Um, and then they just kind of farm it out to people. Like I'm not officially working for that company. They just kind of farm it out. They're like, okay, find someone that has the skill set. Um, and, and answer the calls. So that's an interesting idea. Um, and I'm, I'm curious about offering products for data engineering or data science. Like, I don't know what you mean there. If you're like saying like, oh, well, then I'll just tell them what solutions to use um, or, or what your advice is there. Uh, I think, again, the hard thing there is like, if, if you're only going to be doing the call, like, is there enough work? Do you have enough work in that space? Um, if you build some sort of subscription process to actually like, you know, acquire clients, I could see it happening. But even then, you know, you're going to need to chart, get like 100 clients for it to really, really be worth it, I imagine. But again, I'm not sure on the details of this business model. Let's see. Do you work more or less as a consultant compared to being an employee? I personally am not interested in making more money, but just working less, lessers. Hmm. I'm personally not interested in making more money, but just working oh just working less um I, i'd say a lot of my stuff is, con, is like a consultant less than an employee um right like I'm, I'm generally giving more of an opinion i charge a little more than an employee because i will my goal is to kind of get in there quickly and not like feel like i'm you know stuck uh, uh dealing with a project for two years um you know my my goal is to deal with a project in like three to six months and, and really wrap it up so that's I, i'd say a lot of my work is more consulting um I, I tr I'm trying to push more and more for like high level consulting where it's again, giving more an opinion and not always being stuck in the weeds just because the thing about technical work is it's infinite work, right? Like you've never, like everything you've ever coded could have been coded better, right? Like, you know, if you would have spent another, you know, day or two or a week, it would have been programmed better, but because either a manager or because a client needs it fast, right? Like, yes, you can kind of push it back a little and be like, well, to do it well, you know, I need at least a few more days, but eventually they're going to be like, well, we just need it done today. And so um, technical work is kind of infinite work is the way I always look at it because it can always be written better. Um, now, obviously, we have uh, ChatGPT, so maybe it will write better code faster. But um, yeah, 
Uh, that's why I try to push for more high level ice like consulting opinions. Um, it also tends to pay more, right? Like you tend to get paid more for giving an opinion um, because you're the way it works, right? Like it's like, if you're an IC building something, you can only impact whatever you're building. But if you give an opinion on what 10 ICs are building, you now impacted 10 people's work, um, which is more impactful than you doing one, one person's work. So that's why it tends to be more impactful and you get paid more. <laughs> Um, I, I have a whole range here. So someone's asking about like what I typically offer in terms of uh, like for a company. Basically, what are my packages? Yeah, I mean, I have a whole range. Um, I'll probably be talking about some of them in my actual consulting course. Um, it There is some dependency. Like, obviously, if I'm going to work for a massive client, I'm the package is going to be slightly bigger and more expensive for multiple reasons. They expect a lot more due diligence done, a lot more requirements gathering done. Um and they've just got a lot more bureaucracy to deal with. Uh, whereas if you work with a small startup, right, like you, can, you can be in and out so fast. Um, so it, it, there's some dependencies there. But overall, I do have some kind of packages I work off of. Calls are here. I'm curious what this is. Oh, calls are here to build strategy products or just package if you want. Um, are here to execute strategy. Charging a monthly fee for four calls a month, guarantee a biddable. It's an interesting idea for sure. Um, so this person earlier was asking about a product he's basically trying to build or she, I actually don't know, they, they are trying to build. Um, so, um, it basically their idea is they're going to charge for the amount of calls they get, um, a month essentially, or they give people essentially access to them. Um, this is essentially similar to like a retainer, right? Like there's like a retainer service you can always offer people. Um, but yeah, I mean, it could be interesting. It, you just have to get enough people to make it like worthwhile. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. Don't, didn't want to assume. Um, all right. We, we, we've almost gone through a lot of the questions, at least. I mean, I know I've skipped a few questions and, and I'm sorry. It's like, there are so many and some of you write the same one or not the same one. Some of you write in a lot of questions all at once and I don't want to feel like I ignore certain people. Um, here to see. Uh, this is always hard. Yeah. I finished a data engineering boot camp a month ago, struggling to get a job in this market. I mean, I'll take a quick moment and, and step into the data engineering intro e content stuff. But um, in my in my perspective, um, like I, one, when I first tried to get a job after getting like getting my college degree, I spent like eight or nine months trying to get a job. Um, I was I was still in college, like I was trying to get the internship, and it took like eight or nine months to get that internship. And I was applying and applying and applying and and just. Yeah, it, it was hard. And um, I, it was arguably, a, maybe it was a better market. I, I know there was, there was something about the market back then too that was a little bit frustrating. But, you know, I, I just don't want you to lose hope. Like, yeah, it might take some time, especially if you just finished a boot camp. You know, you, a month is a long time, I know, but it's still not the longest time it could be. So I, I'm hoping the best for you. And I'm hoping, you know, just keep applying, keep talking. If you've got friends that can refer you, have them refer you. Don't Don't get too stuck on on, you know, the time, just make sure you keep track of kind of the activities you're doing to try to get hired. Um, so you don't lose it completely. Um, have you thought about building an offshore team? How would you, how would one uh, go about building a remote offshore team if you didn't have any prior relationship contacts or offshore teams? Um, I've occasionally thought about it. Uh, I, 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 it's kind of the same thing with like scaling my company. I'm not, that's not, I think my goal in the end is to have like a massive consulting company. Um, I get plenty of people who reach out and I could probably find people that I could connect. Like some of my friends I'm sure I could reach out with and, and talk to them and be like, Hey, do you have a, a, a company over um, offshore that you work with that you like? Um, but overall, you know, it's, it's just not my goal. Um, it, it's very easy. Like it's very easy. It's very easy. Okay, let's, okay, so my mic is, should be back, but let me double check. Yeti, and then Yeti. Okay, so to some degree, it's it's very easy to do because there's plenty of people trying to offshore um, in terms of like companies on, on wherever they are at who want to offshore with, with people. Um, but I, I don't know, it's just never been my goal. Let's see. 
trying to think. Nope, that's more of an intro question. More of an intro question. Have you ever think deeply why why that happened? Let's see. Uh, I mean, you couldn't find a job for eight or nine months. I mean, it. I was just getting out of college. I had no experience. I I I think I was talking to people. It wasn't that abnormal. Um, maybe maybe it wasn't that normal but eight or nine months you know while i was just getting started and had zero experience you know that i think that's a lot of people's um you know uh, experience but you know I, I could be wrong um and you know in the grand scheme of things eight or nine months for for me wasn't that bad i know for some people who have like bills and expenses um you know it can be terrible but at that point i was still in college i was still you know just starting to get like i hadn't even fully graduated at that point um let's see Let's see. What is this? Quanta Black, BCG, Gamma. Now, how is these com companies for data engineering as compared to product-based companies? Okay, that I'm going to skip that for now. That's more of a product question. Uh, these are more pro, like intro data engineering questions. Hmm. None of these are consulting specific. I mean, this one's kind of interesting. So Quantum Black, um, BCG, Gamma, how how are these kind of different um, compared to product-based companies? Uh, I, I haven't worked for, for either of those companies, um, but what my assumption is, and this is with a lot of consulting companies, if you get hired as a data engineer, you're still kind of an IC and you're not going to have the same level of ownership um, that you would if you uh, worked at like a product company. The, the, the way it generally works, right? Like it's like, some principal consultant goes into, you know, company A and that person is like, oh, here's the work we need to do, right? They're, they're kind of the real consultant, so to speak. Here's the work we need to do. Um, and then they bring a bunch of, you know, IC data engineers on and they're like, hey, here's the work you need to do. Here's the pro, you know, I've already done the project roadmap, whatever, uh, go do it, right? And you don't really have any ownership of it. You don't really necessarily, maybe you give an opinion here or there, but overall, <laughs> you're most likely just doing work that you're being told to do. Um, whereas in product companies, you kind of have a little more definition of what work you should be doing, you know? Um, but that's, you know, there, there's just generally a little more ownership. Let's see. Oh, this is a funny question. I mean, it's not consulting, but how do you feel about companies pushing data transformations into BI tools like uh, Power BI and consider this to be data engineering? Um, that's always interesting. Um, I think, you know, when, when, when a company doesn't have any data engineers or anyone to really do any data modeling, this makes a lot of sense, right? Like, it's just like, okay, I mean, you got to get it done, right? Like, the work needs to get done. You can't sit here and be like, let's build the perfect data warehouse um, to answer some technical questions or to answer some data questions. So in some sense, in those cases, it makes sense. Uh, I think it's always more interesting when it's like there are other options and that's still the choice that they pick. Because um, long term, right, like it's not always the best solution. It, it's great when you have an employee that will manage that Power BI, you know, you know, that they've built. But as soon as they leave, it, it's generally not like that sustainable. Um, but, you know, when you need it, sometimes it's just better to do it, right? Like it's like, okay, we could wait here and hire a data engineer and spend, you know, two years waiting for them to build something. Or we could just answer this question really quickly right now. So there's always trade-offs in, in those places. Um, but don't let like perfect be the enemy of good, right? Like, yes, you can build the perfect data infrastructure that's got every perfect layer that you've seen in a data, you know, data infrastructure diagram, or you can make sure things get done and then eventually improve it over time, which is likely, you know, uh, not a bad way. I, but I wouldn't consider, you know, Power BI transformations like pure data engineering. There's just so much more that data engineers do besides just, you know, setting up the data. Let's see. Yes, yes, he does. He's got, Darshell has got a lot of data engineering project videos. Um, it's really, really nice. Do you get more requests from enterprises or startups? How do you, how do requirements and prices differ? Um, I probably get like mid market is probably my biggest uh, target currently. Um, requirements. It, so in, I, in the cases with enterprise, it's just like they just expect you to spend like three months looking through their infrastructure and figuring it out. And you kind of have to, but also like there's kind of this expectation that's like you're not just going to come in and figure out what's going on in two weeks. 
Whereas like if I go to a mid-market company, I can probably figure out what's going on in about two weeks. Mostly because it's not just about the infrastructure. It's also about like the bureau, you know, bureaucracy of everything, like what's going on, um, you know, what, what pieces are going where, who's talking to what or talking to who kind of conversations. Um, prices differ. I mean, uh, you know, a startup might flinch if you ask them to pay you, you know, $60,000 for your full project, whereas a uh, enterprise would be like, that's it. Um, to a degree, depending on what team and how big the team is, but like an enterprise will be very, you know, for them paying a hundred thousand, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars is not weird, right? Like if you work with an enterprise that works with Deloitte, I mean Deloitte has a, you know, like two, like two hundred fifty k minimum or something, probably more now. But the last time I heard for one of the projects that someone was working with, it was somewhere in that range. I'm sure it's more now, and that's before they even do like real work, right? Like that's like their like requirements gathering stage. <laughs> So in general, like enterprises just have a very different tolerance and understanding of what money is, right? Like if you're, if you're a billion dollar organization and you're going to come in, especially if it's high, high enough in a team, it's not just like a small little team that needs a little help. But if it's like, you know, an organization that needs help, um, that money is a little bit different for them. Like what seems like a lot of money to you is, you know, nothing to them. <laughs> How do you go about staying updated with all the new DE tools? How do you filter relevant ones out? Uh, I mean, to, to some degree, I, I let my projects dictate that. Like, make sure you have all your core skills, right? Your programming, um, cloud, et cetera. Um, and yeah, pick a few um, popular tools now because that's what's going to sell. But also don't feel like you have to learn every new popular tool. Um, you know, again, Hadoop was really popular for a while there. Um, and it, it would have been great to consult in that space, right? Like if you would were a consultant in the Hadoop era, you were probably making a ton of money because everyone needed help. And it was a very hard problem to deal with. Um, but don't get so stuck on it that, you know, um, when it goes away, you're not ready to switch. Uh, but yeah, you, you know, pick one or two popular things. Make sure you have core skills. So that way when something, you know, the tides change, a new skill comes up, um, you're ready to kind of jump on it. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, I, I'd say like, you know, pick one or two popular things like, right, like right now it'd be like Databricks and Snowflake are, are popular solutions. But honestly, in three to five years, they might not be. And you might have to pick the next one. So just pick some core ones and then you'll pick up all the other little skills along the way. Let's see. But they ask about those niche tools during the screening. Uh I mean, I'm curious, like, I don't know. I, I don't get asked too much about niche tools. Um, or if I do, you know, I make sure to know enough about the tools. Um, I, I'm curious which niche tools you're, you're referring to. Like, if someone were like, uh, have you worked with uh, Apache, uh, Nifi, or Nifi, or however you say that one? I'd be like, no. <laughs> like, I mean, I've worked with everything else. If, if that's what you want. Like, I'd almost not even be interested. Like, to a degree, sometimes you're like, maybe I can't add value here. Uh, maybe I'm going to work, you know, maybe I'm an airflow person. Maybe I work airflow prefect. Um, you know, you, you know enough, but you don't have to know everything. I don't know. That's, that's always my view. It's like, you don't have to know everything. Uh, one idiot interview asked me about what, what is this AWS glue function does. That's, I mean, like, I, again, I, I, for interviews that makes, you know, things can get a little bit harder. Um, this is why I don't do technical interviews for most of my consulting work. Uh, just because I'm like, okay, I mean, I, if you haven't seen my work, if you haven't seen, you know, I've got content, I've got all this other stuff. If, if you don't, if you've seen that and you still want to do this interview round, that's cool. I, I have other things to do. Um, it's generally my, my approach, but if you're getting a job, obviously you have to kind of interview. Some people say AI will replace data engineers, but I think AI will decrease the number of jobs. What do you think? Um, I think this was last week. I, hold on, I was got scanned for a job applied for, to LinkedIn. That's great. <laughs> you got to love the fact that, God, people try to take advantage of people when they're trying to get jobs. Um, in terms of AI replacing data engineers, sorry. In terms of AI replacing data engineers, I don't think we're going to see that happen at least anytime soon. Like I know people like to say, it's like, oh, it does your job. But I, I just think there's still so much that one, there's not enough data engineers at most companies anyways, right? Like most companies have like one, if it's like a small company. Um, so they already need help 
So, so if anything, it'll make their jobs just more effective. Um, so maybe we can finally get to a point where we actually do real work and we're not just constantly playing catch up. Um, so I wouldn't be too afraid. Like most companies need more data engineers or at least more data engineering work done uh, than they have data engineers. So at, at best, we're just going to maybe get to a point where we can finally catch up. And once we finally catch up, all that's going to happen is there will be more work. There's always more work. There's this endless work to be done. Um, so I'm not, I'm not too concerned about it. Like, I, I think it'll help us. I, I hope that that much at least, but like I've worked with some chat GPT and, and things similar to that. And it's like, yeah, it's doing a good job, but it's not doing a great job. Right. It's, I think someone put this uh, in a way it's like, there's so many ways that like people have like written out how to answer leak code problems online. So yeah, it's really good at answering leak code problems, but then as soon as you have to deal with other problems that are more unique, it's maybe not as good. So, but we'll see. I'll be wrong. I'll, I'll, I can be wrong. <clears throat> do you have access related issues when working with enterprises and how do you plan for that? I'm waiting for access approval, et cetera, three months now um, while still receiving uh, positive intent messages. Yeah, I mean, definitely the, this is probably one of the bigger challenges um, that I try to nip in the bud as soon, like basically get figured out as quickly as possible, um, which is access. Um, they should hopefully be a little bit better, but like, yes, access is always like the big thing. It's like, you need to make sure as soon as you can solve an access problem, you get it solved. Um, whether that's getting access through a firewall, whether that's getting a laptop, whether that's, you know, anything. Um, because if you let the client dictate, you know, the access to something, uh, yeah, you'll let their bureaucracy deal with it and it'll take three to six months. Uh, you need to, you know, I'd say like reach out to whoever your stakeholder is, reach out to whoever your, the sponsor of this project is and make sure that they're lighting fires under the right people because you can't just be waiting, um, you, you know, you'll be waiting forever otherwise if you just like sit there passively. You have to actively be trying to like, you know, every day be like, okay, we're at month three, like, I, and this is one reason I, I basically started charging a retainer. It's like, you need to care about this work because I'm going to charge you regardless if I sometimes get it done if you're the one blocking me on it. Um, or we need to end this contract. Because sometimes that's the thing. Like sometimes it's like, well, look, I'm not getting work done. You're not making it easier. I'm just going to end the contract because you're not you're not helping me. You know, and, and sometimes that, that needs to happen. I haven't done that personally, but I've definitely had friends where I've worked on projects with them. Where like, yeah, we weren't getting things um, like opened up for us. And we're just like, look, we're two months in. You haven't opened up. Like we've, we've reached out to the CFO. The CFO knows about this problem. They're talking to the engineering team. Uh, the CEO knows about the problem. Like you, you, your company clearly does not care about our work. Like, and, and sometimes you just got to do that. It's like, look, if you cared about this work, this would be fixed. It's not fixed. We're done. Like sometimes you just have that conversation. Uh, let's see. Hi, what would you consider, um, consider to make the decision to leave a career as a senior business analyst in data integrations to transition to data engineering? Oh, I'd probably lose my seniority. Um, this is kind of not consulting focus, but, I mean, sure, you lose your senior seniority, but like, if you like the work, if it's going to pay more, I, and I don't know if these are true, but if, if those are true, yeah, why not leave for data engineering? Sure, your seniority maybe leaves, maybe. Um, and if you make more money eventually in the long run, that's great. If you like the work, great. Okay, this is how did I start? Um, I covered that a little bit easier or earlier. <laughs> Which, uh, let's see, which cloud platform do I tend to use? I honestly tend to use AWS a lot. Um, I don't know. AWS tends to come up a lot. Um, Azure's obviously the other big one that people in theory use, but I think the other big one I tend to use is it's AWS and GCP, but apparently Azure's big in enterprise. I just haven't saw it that much. Let's see, what is this? I saw a LinkedIn post that a guy said, right now, a fresher should not get into data engineering because... Now there are more experienced data engineers available in the market compared to previous years. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what kind of, I don't know what kind of post that is. Um, sure. There are more experienced data engineers than there were in the past. Companies don't always want to hire uh, experienced data engineers because they're more expensive. Um, generally a good team has like one or two senior, like if it's like a bigger team, right? You have one or two senior people, a few mid people, uh, mid, mid level, and you have a few people that are junior, um, because juniors tend to be cheaper. Um, yes, they'll make mistakes, but you have the senior people that will tell them how not to make those mistakes. And then you're not having to pay 10, you know, senior data engineer job, like 
pay like salaries. So that that's an interesting statement. Um, I'm not sure why someone would say that. Um, I mean that that's true with every thing, right? Like software engineering um, is also that way, right? Like software engineering is like okay, yeah, like at a certain point there were more senior software engineers um, because you know everyone wanted to work for Facebook and things like that and, and Google and get paid tons of money. Did that stop them from hiring junior? No. So I don't know. I don't really get that point. <laughs> <laughs> I need my space at the data table. So if somebody better move over. Well, you got to, you got to start taking out. And I also feel like people eventually run into an issue where like data engineering can wear on people. Like I've often noticed that like at a certain point, um, at least I don't know if this is true around the world, but like in the U S like there's a certain point where people kind of like cap out their interest in being an engineer. Um, they just switch over to like being a project manager or something else uh, generally around like 35, 40, um, don't get me wrong. There are plenty of people who stick around for a lot longer, but I think at a certain point, people want to move up. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't get too stuck on like, you know, there's no jobs for junior engineers. It's hard. It's always going to be hard to get a junior position because companies want everyone to have two years of experience. Um, so yeah, I hope this video may be available on YouTube. Yep. Yeah, this will be available later to watch. Um, so don't worry. I'm going to kind of wrap it up here. We're at, at nine. I think I put this 9.15. I'm going to wrap this up now. I've, my, uh, I just want to get on with the, the... I've got a few things I got to dig into for the rest of the day. But um, other than that, you know, I really enjoyed this. I really love answering all your questions. Hopefully you found this valuable. I don't know if, uh, if you have other questions, feel free to post them here. Again, I'm putting together a bigger course on this. So if you have specific questions, that always helps me answer like those questions there as well. But um, yeah, again, I really appreciate all your guys' time. Um, and I'll see you guys hopefully in the next one. I'll do probably another one here in the next two or three weeks. So thanks all for uh, hanging out and uh, I'll see you guys next time. Thanks. Bye.